All right, if you would open with me to Matthew chapter 23. We have to uh, get moving here in Matthew 23. I'm talking to myself more than you, but uh, we're going to, we're going to, basically we're going to scratch the sermon we prepared for you today and we're going to move ahead and preach something entirely different, but entirely different meaning not the message we were planning to preach to you this morning. We're going to go just a little different direction and kind of fast forward in Matthew chapter 23. So still the same uh, subject matter, still the same thing that we're working on, but we're going to fast forward. So I believe the title was going to be A Lesson in Humility. We'll, we'll talk about that another time. And we're going to fast forward to verse 13 uh, because I need to get all the way down to verse 36 today. <laughs> And the reason I do is because uh, uh, next week is Palm Sunday uh, when we remember the, the Lord's uh, triumphant entry uh, into uh, the Holy City. And so we, we've been working on a series of sermons. I don't know if you remember 2018, 2019, and then 2020 we didn't because, uh, well, some virus happened, you know, and we, we didn't have regular service. So I think we were teaching on Psalm 91. But I want to pick up that series and bring it to a conclusion uh, next Sunday uh, regarding Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry. And in order to do that well, I need to get to the, the end here of Matthew 23. So we're going to just kind of steamroll through this. Uh, we're going to emphasize mostly verses 13 through 15. Uh, but we're going to try to summarize the entirety of Matthew 23. And then perhaps after Resurrection Sunday, we'll come back and uh, talk about uh, things that we missed, perhaps. I actually want to start teaching on uh, eschatology after Easter, uh, talk about final things or the, the last days. And so I don't, I don't know if we'll come back and finish this or we'll do it at some other time in the year. So with all that, let's, let's jump to Matthew chapter 23, and, and we're going to begin here in verse 13. Um, we're going to take up the first 13, 14, and 15 to, be, to begin with. And we're going to talk about uh, the dangers of an unconverted clergy. The dangers of an unconverted clergy. And uh, in the first 12 verses, which is kind of a prologue to the rest of the sermon that Jesus is preaching, uh, in, in the, ver the first 12 verses, he is speaking to this large crowd of people and to his disciples. And now in verse 13, what he's going to do while he's preaching to them is he's going to single out specifically, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he's going to pronounce a series of eight woes upon the scribes and the Pharisees who de he defines as hypocrites. In fact, uh, the term hypocrites is used seven of the eight times that he pronounces woe upon them. And the term woe is a prophetic term for a pronunciation of judgment. He's pronouncing judgment upon this, this uh, unconverted clergy of people, the false shepherds of Israel. And he's making a pronouncement of judgment upon them repetitiously eight different times. Now I think it's amazing because if you think about it, in Matthew chapter 5 we have Jesus' first recorded sermon. And now in Matthew 23, we have Jesus' last recorded sermon in the Gospel of Matthew. And in Matthew chapter 5, you'll remember that Jesus is introducing the kingdom of God to the people. And nine different times, he starts out by saying, blessed. Blessed are you. Blessed, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, for example. In other words, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, the first step to doing that is to realize that you have nothing to offer. To realize that you are poor, that you are bankrupt, that you have nothing to offer God. And so the only way to come into the kingdom of God is to realize that we are spiritually bankrupt. We have nothing to offer Him. It is only He that has something to offer to us. But he started out with uh, nine pronunciations of blessing. Blessed, blessed, blessed. And we call it the Beatitudes, right? And he gives these blessings, these pronunciations of blessing upon the people as he announces the kingdom. And you'll find out in, in prophetic writings and prophetic preachings throughout the Old Testament, 
The prophets had basically two courses of action, two types of prophecy, two types of oracles. They had the prophecies of blessing, of prosperity, of wellness, of good news. But then they also had the pronunciation or the prophecy, the, the oracle of doom, of judgment, of destruction, of death that, was, that would be coming to them. So you have these two forms. And so when Jesus steps out, He begins His ministry by saying, blessed, 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 pronunciations of blessing. And then at the end of the ministry, instead of pronunciations of blessing, they had rejected the King, they had rejected the Kingdom of God, and now He's pronouncing woe upon those who had rejected the King and the Kingdom of God. And now, after going from a series of blessings and pronunciations of blessing, now he's going to a series of pronunciations of doom. It, it would be very similar to us saying, you know, because we don't use the word woe today. Uh, the, the word woe would be like saying damn you or be damned. Seems I remember a preacher saying something like that a few weeks ago. I could be mistaken, right? <laughs> Right, that, that would be what it would be like today. That, that would kind of give us uh, some, some understanding in our modern vernacular. But when Jesus or any of these prophets pronounce doom or judgment, it is not a matter of uh, wishing that it would happen or hoping that it would happen or maybe it will happen. No, it is a declaration that it indeed is going to happen. It is factual. And if we were to follow this through and, and follow the historical record, we know that by 70 A.D., uh, Israel was destroyed, that Jerusalem was trampled <laughs> underfoot, and the judgments that Jesus pronounced upon these Pharisees did indeed come to pass. The woe judgments did come to happen. And uh, we, we have other examples to try to illustrate the significance of this word woe. And the severity of the tone that Jesus is using. You can tell how Jesus is preaching uh, this message, the tone of it, by, by hearing the words that he's using. I mean, he calls these people hypocrites seven times. He calls them sons of hell. He tells them, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? He says, when you make, you try to land and see, see to make one convert, one proselyte, and when you do, you make them twofold a child of hell as yourself. Uh, he says, you, you don't allow people to enter the kingdom of God and neither do you go into the kingdom of God. Uh, you can tell, he calls them blind five times. He calls them fools twice. The word fools is, is where we get the word moron from, which means stupid or foolish. And uh, he, he's being very direct, very uh, concise and clear about what he's saying. When, when you hear Jesus preach, you never leave wondering, I wonder what he meant. <laughs> Jesus is very direct, very clear, and truth is very much that way. Truth is black and white. There's, there's not any gray area with truth. And so that's how Jesus is preaching. He's preaching a series of woes, these pronunciations of judgment. And to illustrate the significance of this, uh, for example, in the uh, to, to show you how the Old Testament prophets would use it. You have Isaiah the prophet in chapter 5. And we're most familiar, I think we all are familiar with this verse. I know I've preached from it here before. In Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20, where, where Isaiah says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And he goes on to, to, to continue that thought. And he says, who put uh, darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to people that call evil good and good evil, right? When, when, we, when we live in a society that is post-modern or post-truth, right, that there's no truth, that uh, will say something that is evil is actually good and something that is good is actually evil. Something that is light, we call it darkness. And something that's darkness, we call it light. We call it the opposite of what it is. Woe to that generation. Woe to those people. But in Isaiah 5, if you were to read the, the whole chapter, I think you started around, uh, I think it's verse 8 through verse 30, you'll see seven pronunciations of woe. 
woe, just like Jesus right here, woe, woe, woe. Well, in Isaiah, woe, 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 several different times. And he ends that prophecy by, you can see that God is saying that he's raising up nations around them that will come into their nation, destroy their nation, and carry them away captive. And that's what Jesus is doing here. Um, another example of this, if we fast forward to use an example from uh, the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, uh, it's talking about the, uh, the series of trumpets. There's uh, <coughs> seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. And these are the judgments of God upon the earth. And you'll remember that uh, these seven trumpets, the first trumpet, a th when the, the first trumpet is blown by an angel, that a third of the trees and grass, in other words, the vegetation, a third of the vegetation is destroyed. And then the second trumpet blows and a third of the seas are destroyed. And all a third of the uh, creatures, the sea creatures that live within the sea are destroyed. And then the third trumpet blows and a third of the fresh water springs are destroyed. So that if you drink from that fresh water, uh, you would die. And that's exactly what the scripture says. And then you get to the fourth trumpet and the fourth trumpet blows and the Bible says that a third of the sun, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were darkened and no longer gave their light. Could you imagine living like that where a third of the sun, a third of the stars, a third of the moon no longer gave forth their light? Can you imagine how dark this planet would be? And that's the fourth trumpet. And after the fourth trumpet... The Bible says that an angel will fly through the heavens, fly through the air, and he's going to cry with a loud voice, Whoa! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth. And it goes on to say the reason why he's crying, Whoa! 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 To the inhabitants of the earth is because of the next three trumpets that are to be blown. Because by the time you get to the sixth trumpet being blown, a third of humanity is destroyed. We thought 2020 was bad. <laughs> As they say, you haven't seen anything yet. Right? And even Jesus backing up to, uh, to that fourth uh, trumpet, you'll remember that even Jesus in Matthew 24 talks about one of the signs prior to His coming, prior to His second advent, is that the sun would be darkened the moon would not give forth its light and that the stars would fall from heaven. No, it's just going to be a dark planet. It's going to be a dark earth. And then when you see Christ come and break through the eastern sky, it's going to show up amazingly because everything's going to be black, dark. And uh, that's, that's the future. That's what is going to come. And it shows you, the reason I use that is to illustrate the, the, the effect or the importance of this word woe. You don't say woe casually. So for Jesus to make these eight pronunciations of woe indicates the coming judgment that is upon uh, the religious leaders, the religious elite of his day. So he says in verse 13, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, again, he says this phrase seven times within this passage. Now, the reason that's important is because He's going to give us the reasons for the woe. Why is he saying woe this many times? Just like Isaiah did the same thing. He gave the reasons for the woe. The reasons why the judgments were being pronounced. Jesus is going to give the reasons for the woes. Okay, But in that, he says hypocrite seven times. I think that's important because, as we discovered before, what does the word hypocrite mean? Acting, right? It's an actor. A hypocrite is an actor, a pretender, a giver of false impressions. And so what he's saying is, to the, to the naked eye, you can't necessarily see these things in the scribes and Pharisees because it's shrouded, their darkness is shrouded in hypocrisy, in pretension in falsehood, in, in acting out, that they have, we've talked about this before, right? When we talked about the church of Sardis, the dead church, 
They had a name that they were alive, Jesus said, but they were dead. Right? They looked alive outwardly. They had a good name, a good reputation, a good reputation in the community. But Jesus called them dead spiritually. So they're hypocrites. This, they're, they're, the danger of them is shrouded in their acting, their pretending. Uh, it's shrouded in hypocrisy. Notice the first thing he says, the first reason why he pronounces woe upon them for, or because you could say, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now I want you to notice three words in this verse. Shut, allow, and entering. The image that Jesus is giving us is that the sheep of Israel, if you will, the children of Israel, are coming in this direction. They're trying to enter. They're trying to go in. They're trying to, to, to know Christ, to follow Him. And in the process of them coming to try to enter, to go in, these scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites were shutting the door in their face. That, again, the danger of an unconverted clergy and the reason for the first woe is because they do not allow people to go to heaven. They block their path to heaven. These are people that are shutting the door of salvation and opening the door to damnation. Jesus says very clearly to them um, that you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for you neither go in yourselves. They're not going to heaven and then watch this. Nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. You know, I, I was thinking about it. How many people are going to hell today and they're going to hell today because they're following a false spiritual leader? They're following a false shepherd. And because they're following a false shepherd, the false shepherd is leading them in the way of destruction, not leading them in the way of salvation. I began to think about how prevalent that is. This was extremely prevalent for them uh, amongst the scribes and the Pharisees. And I, I thought that it would be good to give some examples. Uh, I don't know how many I'll give, but at least one or two good examples of of how the scribes and Pharisees, every time the kingdom of God was being presented to people, how the Pharisees and the scribes would get in the way and block the way. How, how they would stop people from entering. How they wouldn't allow them to go forward to salvation. And the first one that comes to mind is real simple. John the Baptist. Now, now we know John the Baptist comes on the scene after 400 years. You've got to remember, there's 400 years of silence. You've got to put yourself in that time to imagine the, the wonder of what it was like to have John the Baptist come about. 400 years of silence. There's been no word from God. There's no prophet from the Lord. There, there's no revelation coming from heaven anymore. And, and they're getting, uh, this is when the Pharisees came into power and prominence. There was no word from God and these guys became, you know, their own self-appointed messengers. So one day after 400 years of this silence, then here comes John the Baptist, the first prophet in these 400 years. And when he arrives, he, he's out in the, the wilderness. He's out in the desert. He's not in the city. He's a peculiar fellow. Not only does he live out in the, the wilderness or the, the desert, uh, he dresses in a camel coat and a leather belt. He, eat lo he eats locusts and wild honey. He's kind of a strange guy. When you get out to hear him preach, um, instead of telling you something you might would like to hear, he tells you to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand is meaning nearby. It's right here. It's in your grasp. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he's baptizing people in the river Jordan. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3 that they're confessing their sins. So when you would go hear John preach, John's preaching repentance, he's preaching baptism, and people are there confessing their sins. When you went out to hear John preach, you didn't hear John preach about seven ways to a successful marriage. 
or three ways to, to build the life of your dreams. You hear John the Baptist preaching a message of repentance, a message of baptism, a message of uh, confession of sin. And I'm saying, he, he defies all logic, all norms. Well, would you start a ministry in the desert? Do you realize that, that, that roughly where John the Baptist was baptizing people in the River Jordan, it, it was said by Josephus, the Jewish historian, that it was 18 miles. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was 18 miles. And then where John the Baptist was doing baptism was about another five miles beyond that. So about 23 miles. Who starts a ministry 23 miles out in the desert from civilization, if you will? Who does that? And, and I want you to think about the sacrifice that these people had to make. I mean, they didn't jump in their car and just drive 23 miles and go be baptized and head back home. If you went there, how long would it take you to walk 20 some odd miles? Right? I don't know. I mean, I've never done it. <laughs> don't, don't plan to do it now. <laughs> There was a commitment. There was, it wasn't convenient. Uh, he, John didn't put himself in Jerusalem in a convenient location where everybody could just come. You had to pay a price. You, you had to be inconvenienced to go hear John preach. And then when he got out there, after all that inconvenience, he's going to yell at you, repent. you got to be baptized and confess your sins. Who is this guy? I mean, he doesn't even look very nice. He's wearing a camel's coat. He doesn't have nice robes like the Pharisees have. Why do we listen to this guy? He eats locusts. Who eats bugs? By the way, locusts are not that bad, actually. They're, they're quite good. I had some in Thailand before. They're, they're a little crunchy, a little chewy on the inside, you know. But the legs are really good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this is not, uh, he, he's defying all logic, all norms, you know, he doesn't buddy up with the, the Pharisees and the scribes in the community, uh, instead when the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees come out to hear him, you know what he says to them? Brood of vipers. You know what a brood of vipers is? So, your sons of snakes, your snakes... Your fathers were snakes. And who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? And he told them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. He told them that the axe is laid at the, the root of the tree and ready to be thrown into the fire. He's talking to them. Who does that? That's not, I mean, he missed the class, how to win friends and influence people, right? <laughs> he doesn't know what ministry is like in 2021. You would never do these things. And I tell you, I get so blessed by that because that was a genuine move of God. People are traveling from, the Bible says, from Jerusalem, Judea, all the surrounding areas. People are traveling to hear John preach. And they don't mind that it's a message on repentance. They don't mind that they have to confess their sins. They don't mind that they have to be publicly baptized in front of everybody. That is a move of God. There, there's no... Right, we're, we're living in 2021 America, right? Uh, what's in it for me? What, what am I going to get out of this? I'll tell you what you'll get out of it. You'll get to be on the right path. You'll, you'll, be on the, you'll go, go through the straight gate, the narrow path that leads to salvation. That's, that's what you get out of this. And I love it because it's so countercultural to what we would expect uh, someone to follow the norms and what those norms should be. John defies all of that. And, uh, and he tells them, he says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but one coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandal straps I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He says, the winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. The wheat he will gather into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. You know what that means? Jesus takes the believer and He baptizes the believer with the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus takes the unbeliever and he baptizes the unbeliever in fire. Talking about eternal fire. One gets the Holy Spirit, one gets fire. The wheat, what does he do? He cleans out the threshing floor. That's the earth. He cleans out the threshing floor. He cleans out the earth. How does he do it? He gathers his wheat, his harvest, his people into his bar. But the chaff, the part that looks like wheat, but it's not wheat. He takes the chaff, the unbeliever, and he throws it into the fire to be burned forever. That's how John the Baptist preached. That's what you would go out, that's what you would travel 20 some odd miles to hear if you were leaving from Jerusalem. Would you do that? Would I do that? That, my friend, is a real move of God. When we, we can see that type of thing happen and people love the truth to that degree that they, they don't mind being told that they have to repent. They don't mind that they have to confess their sins. They don't mind that they have to be publicly baptized. They don't mind that they make a public confession of faith in Christ. But you know what happens? Well, after that, of course, Jesus comes to be baptized. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. And then Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be te tempted by the devil for 40 days. You know what happens after that? Jesus comes back in uh, verse 12 of Matthew chapter 4. It says that Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, been imprisoned. So somewhere between those 40 days that Jesus was gone in the spiller, in, in the, oh, excuse me, led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. Now, somewhere in those 40 days, John gets arrested. <laughs> now, why would he get arrested, right? I mean, what is, was it something he said? <laughs> well, was it something he said that offended somebody in, in leadership that they didn't like? And they said, we're going to arrest this guy? Yeah. And, and what was John doing? Remember when, when Jesus, John recounts it this way, John's gospel. Remember when Jesus came to be baptized? What did, Jesus, what did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What's he doing? He's pointing everybody to them, to, to Jesus. Pointing the whole people to Jesus. In fact, later in John's gospel as well, we see that, uh, that uh, John the Baptist tells his disciples to go follow Jesus. John the Baptist is the one that says that uh, he must increase and I must decrease. I must be less visible. He must be more visible. In other words, what was John the Baptist doing? He wasn't gaining converts to himself. He was gaining converts to Christ. He was simply pointing the way of salvation and showing people how to get saved through Jesus Christ. What were the Pharisees doing? Blocking it. Stopping it. Throw that man in jail. Let's, let's, and again, what were the Pharisees doing? We talked about this three weeks ago. What, what did they do? They made converts to their sect, to their denomination, to their religion. They, they, didn't, they didn't make converts to Christ. They made converts to their own sect. In other words, in their view, you weren't saved unless you were part of their little group. But John the Baptist was not like that. He was a door opener, not a door closer. He was opening the door to the kingdom of heaven, not closing the door in people's face. And then if you follow all through Jesus' ministry, all through the early church's ministry in the book of Acts, guess what you see? The Pharisees constantly obstructing the message of Christ. Whether it was Paul preaching it, whether it was Peter preaching it, whether it was John preaching it, whether it was Jesus preaching it, Constantly obstructing the way of salvation that was being preached through them. My friend, find yourself a door opener, not a door closer. Find someone that's opening the door of salvation to people, not somebody that's closing the door of salvation in people's faces. So number one reason why the woe. Woe because... Out of heaven. They keep people out of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers, therefore you receive the greater condemnation. Um, here's the second woe. And we're going to speed up right here, right now, okay? I got to get to verse 36, so this is just going to be steamrolling, all right? You ready? So, point number two. Point number two. Woe number two is this. Um, they are uh, pretentious about their devotion to God. And they take advantage of the weak, right? They take advantage of the widows. They take advantage of the widows for pretense that make long prayers. In other words, their devotion to God is pretentious. It's fake. The only time they pray is when they're in public. They don't pray in private. The only time they spend time in the Word is when they're public and not when they're private. Uh, verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Here's the third woe. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much as son of hell as yourselves. The third woe is because when they make converts, again, they make converts to their sect, or what we would call a denomination. They make converts to their denomination, right? Um, this is not uncommon today, right? We... we um, You'll hear people say, I'm going to pick on the Catholics just because uh, it's easy. So, um, you know, you, you got, well, I was baptized a Catholic. I was catechized a Catholic. I was confirmed a Catholic. And their identity is not around Christ and what Christ has done, but their faith is in the process that they've gone through, the sacraments of the church, not in Christ. Right? And that's the danger, right? When we start to identify with a movement or with a denomination or with a sect and our identity is not in Christ or being a Christ follower or a disciple of Christ, that is a real problem. That's why, you know, I've, I've you know, ministered to people that are close to death, obviously, being in the ministry. And one thing that you'll find, you know, whether they were Roman Catholic, whether they were Lutherans, whether they were Protestant of some sort, what you'll find time and time again is if they were a person that is standing on, well, I was confirmed this, I was baptized this, I was catechized in this, they have no security of their salvation. They have no idea where, where they're going when they die. None. Because all their life, their faith has been in the church, not in Christ. And that's exactly what the problem here was with the Pharisees. Uh, if you didn't convert to Phariseeism, you were outside the kingdom in, in their view. So when you make converts to that type of mentality, you turn them out to be twice as bad as you. It, it's sort of like uh, it's sort of like when you when you make it uh, on the positive side now. When you make a new convert to Christ, and they didn't they didn't grow up in church, they didn't know the Lord, they didn't go to 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 to, to uh, you know, they didn't receive any training in Christ or the Bible or scriptures and they lived a bad life, a sinful life and they come to Christ. Most often those people are your most zealous for preaching the gospel. They're the most zealous about teaching the word. They're the most zealous about evangelism and outreach. People that grew up in church and they've been around it their whole life, a lot of times they're not as zealous about it. But you get a new convert that didn't know the Lord and now he knows the Lord and light bulb has gone on. Woo! You know, and they're all they're all about it. Let's let's move. Let's let's get going. We got a world to save, you know, and, and that, that's the mentality. So just like you get that in Christianity on the positive side, you get it in the negative side where uh, if you're not careful, if, if, the, if the conversion is made into being a part of a denomination and Christ is not central then that person can very well be twice as much a son of hell. Uh, and, and that brings out something else uh, that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. You'll notice at the end of verse 14 that he says that they will receive a greater condemnation. He talks about people being twice as much a son of hell. I mean, how can he be twice as much a son of hell? Well, something the scriptures teach us you can read about it in Matthew chapter 11. I believe it's verses 20 to 24. You can read it in Revelation chapter 20 at the final judgment. There are degrees of damnation in hell. There are degrees of judgment in eternity. 
not everybody's going to get the same degree of judgment. Just like in heaven, not everybody's going to get the same degree of rewards. We will all be rewarded for the deeds done in the body, whether good or evil. Some of us in heaven will have greater rewards, and some of us in heaven will have lesser rewards. Some people in hell will have greater degrees of judgment, and some will have lesser degrees of judgment. But hear me. The greatest degrees of judgment that Jesus pronounced in Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 through 24, are, are, are designated for religious leaders that led people astray. But let me say it to you this way. Leaders are either leading people to heaven or leaders are leading people to hell, but leaders are always leading. Right, right now, I'm either bringing you closer to heaven or I'm bringing you further away from it. And, and there's no middle ground. You're always leading people one way or another, whether that's for good or that's for bad. And so that's what Jesus is getting at here. Uh, the fourth woe. I'm not going to make any teaching on this. I'm just going to blow through this really quick. The, the, the fourth woe. Woe to you blind guides. Well, first of all, I am going to make a comment. <laughs> I spoke too soon there. I should, I should never said that. Blind guides, right? Um, what happens when the blind lead the blind? They both do what? Fall into the ditch, right? And uh, do you want a blind guide in life? Now, he's, he's comparing religious leaders to guides, right? Do you want to have a blind guide that's leading you? No. Uh, you know, let me ask it to you this way. Does it matter who your pastor is? Does it matter what teaching you hear? Does it matter the messages you hear from the Word of God? Does it matter? And it, it matters absolutely. Because they're guiding you one way or another. I remember, uh, for example, it's a practical example, but it, it's, it's good. Um, you know, doing missionary work, I, I would uh, work with natives, locals, right, mostly. And uh, I didn't, so there wasn't a lot of uh, people with me from, from here. So doing that, you're always being led around by guides that you don't know where you are. I mean, I have no idea where I am. And you're relying 100% on your guide, who is a native speaker and understands the language. You're, you're relying on them to get you from one place to another because if they left you, you wouldn't even know where to go. And I remember this one time in Korea, I was staying in, uh, I don't even remember the name of the place to with you. I kept a business card. This will show you how I didn't know anything where I was. I had a business card in my pocket with the uh, address and location of where I was in Korean. In that writing, I couldn't read it. It was in Korean language. And I'm with my Korean guide, this pastor that's guiding me from point A to point B, and he gets lost. Now, all the signs are in Korean. Everybody speaks Korean. Now, if he's lost, what does that say about me? I'm doubly lost, right? I mean, it is the blind leading the blind, and we're both falling in the day. We were lost for like 15 minutes. And, and, and sometimes you would get lost, and you would have to like... Just kind of like point at a sign and try to, you know, get people to understand you by just, you know, uh, mannerisms and so on and so forth. But, yeah, you don't want to have a blind guy. You don't want to have someone leading you that doesn't know where they're going. And uh, it's so essential, so important that what type of teaching you expose yourself to, what type of preaching you hear on a regular basis, because it affects, even as Jesus said earlier... It can affect your eternal destiny. It can affect whether you're uh, a sincere Christian or a fraud. It can affect whether you have sincere faith or not. It can affect whether you're a hypocrite or not. It can affect all of those things. So the, the next woe is that they made, uh, if you were to read this, verse 16 to 22, they made up an elaborate system of oaths and vows by which they could get out of keeping their word. And Jesus basically says to that in Matthew chapter 5, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Everything else is from the wicked one or the evil one. So, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, 
justice, mercy, faith, these you ought to have done without leaving the others undone, blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. The next woe is because they major on minors. They emphasize the little things and they don't emphasize the big things. Okay? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that you that the outside of them may be clean also. He's going to say the same thing in verses 27 and 28. Um, his woe here is that uh, don't be outwardly righteous, but inwardly not. Be inwardly righteous, and then you will be outwardly righteous. And then lastly, woe, verse 29. Again, verse 27, 28 is, is a carryover. It, it is another woe, but it's the same thing that he's talking about, the same point. Verse 29, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? This last woe is this. Their fathers killed the prophets. They are going to kill the one whom the prophets prophesied about. They're going to kill the Messiah. So I'm going to leave you there with that, right? I mean, the rest is just a, a Jesus speaking how he's going to send uh, preachers to them and they're going to kill them, they're going to persecute them, they're going to crucify them. They're going to do all these things, and that's exactly what they did. All throughout that first century church, they just persecuted them left and right. And then um, he pronounces again judgment upon them. So these are the woes of Jesus, and he's telling us of the dangers of an unconverted clergy. The dangers. Now, yeah, <laughs> Do we even think in terms of that even being possible? Do we even think that it's possible to have unconverted clergy? Clergy that are not saved, that preach the Bible, but they don't believe the Bible? I mean, most of us have probably the thoughts never entered our minds. But Jesus speaks to this very fact that there are indeed unconverted clergy. I know people that have gone into the ministry, hear me, that do not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And they're preaching. I know people that have gone into the ministry that do not believe that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible, inspired Word of God. They don't believe it. But yet they preach every Sunday. There are unconverted clergy members. And we have to be aware of them. Let's, uh, let's close right there. Leave it on a happy note. <laughs> Come back next week. We'll be uh, changing gears and talking uh, about the uh, triumphant entry of Christ. And then, of course, we have Resurrection Sunday, which is always a lot of fun. And then, uh, of course, Good Friday. We have Good Friday in the middle of that. And we will be serving communion uh, as well that night. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for the truth. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would raise up people like John the Baptist, preachers of righteousness, preachers of uh, repentance, people that are uh, not afraid and people that will speak the truth, uh, even when it's not popular, even when it's offensive to people. Um, the truth is always offensive. I mean, Jesus offended people all the time. And uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, your truth would prevail uh, in our lives. Uh, we know we can't force it upon other people, force people to believe and accept it, but that is a work of grace in uh, their hearts that you, Lord, would make it real to them. But Lord, help us to avoid the, uh, the dangers of unconverted clergy members, to avoid these woes uh, that we see so often in leadership. Uh, Lord, help us and uh, preserve us and cause us to persevere uh, in the days that are upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.